This conference will now be recorded. The world trading order was already undergoing. This conference will now be recorded. Was facing serious problem. The appellate bodies of World Trade Organization were not allowed to function. And there cannot be a World Trade Organization which doesn't have the most important tenet of it, the appellate system not functioning. We already seen even before that. In the last 10 12 years, the this COVID came at a time. Will now be recorded. There are already vulnerabilities in the global trading system and global economy. As we all know, the big economies, the US, people are saying could go into recession even before this happened because US economy was propped up largely by the tax breaks. Therefore, once the effect of tax break was winning away, the automatically the feeling was that the steroid is going. So therefore now the economy may not be sailing through as well as it was doing in, in the next past three years. European Union was already facing a problem. In fact, the biggest economy in European Union, Germany, was also saving itself from the disgrace of getting into recession. And then Brexit, the cloud of Brexit was already over the European Union, and therefore there were also the uncertainties related to that, as well as the future that will unveil after that was something which was worrying everybody. And in that context, you should see that when the coronavirus came in, almost in December, and then hit the world in the last few weeks, the world was already not so strong and not so settled. And it always happens, like in case of Corona itself, that if the patient had already underlying health issues, it will be affected more by Corona. So the world economy was already under some sort of a stress, and therefore it really has now created a lot of issues before the world trading order also economic. As my friend Vijayji asked me to speak about the positive side of it. And as I was saying, whether Corona otherwise, the economy was under some sort of a stress globally. And the IMF also was projecting that the global growth will go down. In G20, which is 86% of the global GDP, the multilateral agencies were making presentation to the G20 leaders that economy of the world will face some uncertain challenges. So therefore, this was there, but that was partly a cyclical issue. It always happens that the world economy cannot go indefinitely. It happens always that there will be ups and downs. But Corona has actually shaken its the foundation of our own thinking and there will be def definitely therefore new opportunities like whenever there has been in the past thousands of years or more than tens of thousands of years in the human history whenever there has been a seismic activity something new emerges the fertile region comes from nowhere so therefore, there are going to be bound to be very big opportunities. And I think, as he correctly said, let's talk about that more. One, purely from India's perspective. If you really look at it, geopolitically, a prime minister has actually reached out to all the important leaders of the world also, conversely, most of the world leaders have reached out to him. And they have been talking to each other on many global issues. Prime Minister offered medical help to many countries, including the most developed countries of the world. 
take the US, whether it is Europe and others. So that shows that geopolitically, India has emerged as a friend, a reliable friend, a friend who could be trusted. Unlike that, some other country must have suffered geopolitically immensely. There have been doubts raised about the intentions, about the actions of some other countries. But India, in contrast, has emerged as someone who is a trustworthy, reliable friend. So this is geopolitical. If you look at it, in the next few years time, the world will be flush with a lot of liquidity. All the central banks of the world are opening the chest virtually for not only the governments but also to non-government actors. There have been some blending by the central bank to the private companies, to the banks directly. Interest rates have gone down dramatically. So with liquidity and interest rates going down, and at least in immediate future, there will not be so much of demand for that money because economic activity from almost zero globally will pick up little slowly to the previous levels. The liquidity and the money will have to be deployed somewhere. If you look at it, India seems to be the logical destination because there is no other country in the world will have so much of demand for or so much of appetite for getting that investment as much as India would be. No country in the world would need to invest into infrastructure as much as India would be required to do it. There will be large and if Indian companies which are doing will also attract FDI. A very good example of that is Relax Industries in their fully owned subsidiary Geo, they could get such a huge investment for less than 10% of the equity of that company from a player like Facebook. At a time when everybody is struggling to find out what is to be done, of course, it's a great entrepreneurship on the part of Bukesh Ambani that he and Facebook could arrive at a deal to create the type of rosy picture that you're talking about, the positive news. So India would be the country where you can get a lot of inward remittances, either into the secondary market, what we call it as portfolio investment, or into the foreign direct investment, or even as a private equity investment. Because the liquidity, the pension fund, the sovereign wealth fund will be flush with money. We'll have to park it somewhere, invest into some paper, and they will obviously be looking out opportunities of this kind. Another aspect of the positive side would be that manufacturing and the global value chain, the global supply chains, India would have a great opportunity to benefit from it. There's a very good validation of this point. If you look at it, what is uh, India's pharma industry now serving the healthcare of the world in a way, if not fully, partly? Why? Because Indian pharma industry is part of the global value chain. We may be getting some bulk drugs from outside, but in formulations, India is probably, if you can call it, the capital of generics. And 
there was a time two decades ago when all the multinational companies did actually develop a molecule for a new drug delivery system. But lately, in the last 20, 30, 20, 20 years in particular, and I'm saying this because I watched it, because in 1999, I was a Minister of Chemicals and Fertilizer, which included pharmaceuticals, and therefore I was responsible for this sector. And I've seen how well they've grown in the last 50, 20 years. They develop their own molecules, they develop delivery system. And therefore, this is an example of how India can benefit from shifting of base manufacturing to India, India becoming part of a global value chain, global supply chain, and therefore more and more sectors can be added to this. Pharma is not only one. I can tell you the part of healthcare, not pharma, is medical devices. I am a currently though Four terms, I am a member of parliament, was member of parliament from Maharashtra, where our, both the organization that you organize today, this program, are based. Though I was born in Mumbai, lived up my life in, all my life in Mumbai. Four times Lok Sabha member from there, but now I am a member of parliament after serving one term from Haryana. Now I am a member of parliament from Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh in Vishakapatnam has set up a special economic zone for medical devices. This is something very interesting that now India would be producing medical devices which could be sold probably in different parts of the world as now we are selling the pharmaceuticals. So in healthcare, we are actually expanding a basket. In addition to that, again the positive news is the inward medical tourism. People come to India for medical treatment because they can get it at a fraction of a price that if the patient has to do it somewhere else in the world. So the good part of that would be in future, we'll see many of these activities happening. In manufacturing, in global value chains, in global supply chain, in services, like it happened in case of automobiles. India's total manufacturing, more than 52% comes from automobiles alone. Large value chains, large supply chains have emerged, which can actually not only service the Indian automobile industry, but they are part of a global value chain where they export their products globally. And as you said, rightly so, that many of these which are described, whether our pharma companies, whether our automobile components, definitely all automobile components, most of them are in small and medium scale sector. Pharma has a little bit outgrown, but not outgrown to a level though some of them are multinational, they sell their products globally. But still they are not as large as the large industries as we call them. So as goes without saying that we must support the small and medium enterprises. Small and medium enterprises will be the backbone or it's already the backbone but will even more backbone of the future industrial growth of India. And why? Because as I said, that when we will develop new global value chains and supply chains, obviously, they will be mainly small and medium enterprises. Those will supply parts to others. Foscom, for example, is the largest producer or contact manufacturer for many electronic products, including handphones. They're based in China and many other places. But they assemble it. They finally get components made from different small and medium enterprises. And final product is assembled in a huge assembly plant that they have. 
is mind boggling size when you look at those plants but such large plants cannot survive without small and medium enterprises in fact just iphone cannot survive without contract manufacturing of company like foxconn and foxconn cannot survive without small and medium enterprises helping them to be the market leader what they have become so in the future there will be a need and relevance for small scale industries more than any other time in the past and as it is i have seen that small and medium enterprises are the largest exporter of the country sometimes they may be exporting through the merchant trading houses but they are really the source of largest exports they are the reason for large, largest employment generation they are the cause for the largest economic output may be captured eventually because they are sometimes work at intermediary level may be captured eventually in the large industries books but still they are the cause for making this happen and therefore in future small and medium enterprises will have to be the future of india's trade and industry as it is a retail trade is almost in the hands of small business there are of course some organized retail which has just come in but most predominant trade happens because of small traders not just retail this type but even the value chains when the grain we buy as a grain merchant the back ended part of it from the field to his warehouse happens through small traders small businesses whether they are transporters whether they are um, aggregators whether they are the processors they do all of that but these are all small businesses so small business is the backbone of india's economy and therefore we have to work in a very important man i am very sure as we go along india will have a definitely a bright future we always seen that the dark clouds which hover around in the horizon they are just the transitory phase the clouds go away and the sun shines again i am sure we'll see india's economy again becoming as bright and as promising as it deserves to be under the leadership of our prime minister narendra modi in the next few time and i am very sure because i have prepared personally myself the plan for 5 trillion dollar economy in which 20% of that will come from industry that is 1 trillion 60% of that 5 trillion will come from services that is 3 trillion a trillion dollar that is another 20% of 5 trillion dollar will come from agriculture and therefore we will be reaching that mark and our mission for sure the present deceleration of activities will definitely delay it little bit but will definitely be there for sure i remember i prepared a plan very interesting plan that if all the districts of india grow at 3% more than the normal growth india gdp will be 3% more than the normal growth that it could have because all the districts of india together 729 district will together add to india gdp we aggregate all the district gdp and that becomes india gdp So if we make every district grow faster and more, we'll have that growth faster, and we'll reach the target sooner. So that's something which I'm working. I've taken six districts of India, and those six districts, one in Uttar Pradesh, Varanasi, um, one in the south, Vishakhapatnam, in Andhra Pradesh, in Sindhu Durg Ratnagiri, in Maharashtra, in west, Muzaffarpur, in Bihar, in the east. and solan one hilly district in himachal pradesh so six districts of india are already working through intervention of indian issue of management who i had appointed as well as national council for applied economic research who had done that and we entered a second phase so just imagine this will be the bottoms up approach to india's growth story so the positive side will be india will grow because of macro reason which has cited but also will be accelerating its growth because of micro development that will happen through district led growth 
So I think it will be very interesting to see India's future, which will be, of course, be driven by entrepreneurs and SMEs like you. So I really offer you my best wishes. And I am sure uh, we will see better of India in the years to come. I'm old, but Sangeeta would definitely be seeing this more than her father. And I'm sure she'll be a part of not just watching it, but also be the reason for making it happen. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the compliment. Sir, we have uh, one or two questions. Is it possible to take them, sir? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. OK, we have uh, one of our members who's asking. Uh, he's interested to understand how the government of India is going to help us get more contract manufacturing opportunities similar to what China gets. You know, actually, if you've seen, even before this happened, the Prime Minister announced a very important uh, initiative that is manufacturing India. We have a lower tax structure. Probably one of the lowest that one could think about when we look at around the competition. Secondly, when as the Commerce Minister spoke out and Mr. Baba Kalani was made the chairman of that committee to look into the special economic zones and how they can be revitalized. So I think this is a good opportunity. Of course, I'm not saying only this much is necessary. We need to work on more. But he's absolutely right when he asked this question that contact manufacturing. In fact, I was giving this example to you. If you really look at it, in farmers, when I said about Foxcam and others, but very interestingly, India's pharma industry, though now become globally competitive and globally recognized and globally acclaimed, in many areas, they also started as contact manufacturers. They used to work for large multinational companies. And then eventually they became very competitive. So contact manufacturing is a good way of entering a very competitive business. For example, pharma industry is a very knowledge-based industry and in which if you work on contact manufacturing, it always helps. You'll be very happy to know that today, India has probably one of the, one of the largest US FDA, European FDAs, and also Japanese FDA approved manufacturing facilities. We have more or less all good pharma companies have WHO GMP standards. And therefore, this all starts from where, as you correctly asked, maybe from the lower end, but we have climbed the ladder now. So contact manufacturing will be a good beginning to enter a value chain. And over a period of time, we could be a leader in that. So you're absolutely right in saying that. Uh, so last two questions. Uh, the post-COVID-19 economic scenario would be drastically different ever expected. Most significant change would be emergence of a new model of globalization. India's past FTAs and future FTAs will have to be revoked. Your view on such an evolving situation, sir? You know, the globalization is a very generic term. What is specific to globalization will change from time to time. In fact, if you really look at it, in the last several decades, we have seen globalization reaching. But doesn't mean that there was no globalization before that. So globalization is very generic. Each country will have to align their strategies and their national strategies to their global trade policies. And I think that's an ongoing exercise which will keep happening. And therefore, we'll have to protect our interest, but we'll also have to promote our interest. If you protect and only be defensive, we'll not be able to get a pie of this global market. Our exports will have to rise. And if our exports have to rise, we'll have to get market access to other markets. And if you have to get market access to others, we'll have to deal with the global players and the global markets very aggressively, very proactively. So I think this is something which will be an ongoing exercise and has to be calib calibrated in a manner that will take first 
our national interest and obviously promote our global commercial interest. Question, uh, what are the gaps which private organizations can help with in fighting COVID-19 and supporting the government? Sorry? Uh, what are the gaps which private organizations can help with in fighting COVID-19 and supporting the government? And I think there are obviously the organization, trade organization, trade bodies, all the civil service, civil society organization, all of them play a very key role in bridging these gaps as you correctly mentioned. Because obviously, and I have been in the government, I have handled 10 cabinet position over the last 25 years. I know it better. That It's not that government can claim to know everything. So obviously, opening the doors, keeping the eyes and ears open and ensuring that we get the right feedback from organizations, state bodies actually help the government a great deal. In fact, this type of consultative exercise will go a long way in ensuring that at a time when we are making policies, we understand it at the right time. In fact, when I was making Electricity Act, I was all the time consulting people to a point that my colleagues in the ministry at that time, the officers told me that at this rate, we were consulted every citizen of India. It almost became like that because we did it. We had almost 1,500 roadshows of our power sector reform. We are looking at interlinking of rivers, one of the most controversial public policy initiative. Mr. Vajpayee, Atal Bari Vajpayee had asked me to look into that as a minister in charge of that. I was I had 5,000 roadshows in India. When we are making fertilizer policy, I had kept it in public domain. In fact, the new industrial policy, we had so many roadshows, including in Northeast and other parts of India, as the Commerce Industry Minister recently, and we had put that tough industrial policy on the website of India. So idea was that we should consult as many people. So point is well taken. We need to have more and more consultation. At the same time, you must also offer some reason why we're not able to accept it. That's what I was doing whenever I was doing a fertilizer policy. Every suggestion was made. If it was not accepted, we should give the reason for it. I think we should work in such a proactive way that will really help us. Thank you very much. Very little time, we will not really take more questions. I'd like to request Mr. Vijay Karanthi to propose a vote of thanks. Is uh, just a minute. I just okay. Thank you. Okay, let me propose a vote of thanks to all of you for coming here and helping each one of us to talk to each other. So thank you very much. We'll be in touch and really looking forward to more thank such interactions with all of you. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, sir, for the positive you, uh, outlook you've given. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.